Ask me no questions and I will tell you no fibs, one of the characters in an Oliver Goldsmith play memorably said. And I was reminded of this line while watching the current farce being enacted over the fate of the elected member of parliament from Srinagar, Farooq Abdullah, in which one fib after the other is being told. On Monday, parliamentarians cutting across party lines demanded that the Modi government allow the former Chief Minister of Jammu and Kashmir to attend the current session of parliament, the first new one since the abolition of JNK's autonomy and statehood in August. It's bad enough that Union Home Minister Amit Shah lied to Parliament on August the 6th about Abdullah's illegal detention and has now stonewalled the latest demand. Worse, on Tuesday, Lok Sabha Speaker Om Birla stated a blatant mistruth that Shah had not lied to the House during the Article 370 debate. Birla told the House that Abdullah had been formally detained only on September the 15th, that is five weeks later. In this episode of Beyond the Headlines, I will unravel not just the lies the government has told the country about Abdullah's arrest, but also the utterly illegal nature of the detention orders that have been slapped against hundreds of politicians and others in Kashmir since August the 5th. Before I come to the question of Farooq Abdullah's fate, I want to remind you about whom exactly we are discussing. Abdullah has been Chief Minister of the undivided and erstwhile state of Jammu and Kashmir three times. He's been a Rajya Sabha member for one term. He has thrice been elected as a member of the Lok Sabha and served in the Union Cabinet as a minister for about a decade. He has been fielded by the Government of India before international delegations as a democratically elected representative of the Kashmiri people. For the past several decades, the diplomatic and political message the Government of India has sent out through people like Abdullah is that all talk of plebiscites and referendums and the resolution of the Kashmir issue has lost its relevance since the people of JNK have been asserting their aspirations via the ballot box. Today, Abdullah is in jail. Two other former chief ministers, Mehbooba Mufti and Omar Abdullah, are in jail. Dozens of other politicians who have taken part in elections at one time or the other are also in jail. Some are under house arrest, others kept captive in makeshift detention centers in Kashmir and even outside in other parts of India. There are three questions about these arrests which should disturb us. First is the question of law, second of morality, and third, what the Modi government's Gestapo-type tactics are doing to India's diplomatic position. Let me consider each one by one. On the morning of August the 5th, Farooq Abdullah was among those Kashmiri leaders placed under house arrest by the government of India. On August the 6th, in other words, one day later, Amit Shah denied that Abdullah had been detained. Farooq Abdullah ji ko na detain kiya gaya hai, na arrest kiya gaya hai, apni marji se apne ghar par hai. Now the next day, Abdullah spoke to the media in Srinagar to refute the Home Minister's claim. The Home Ministry is lying in the Parliament that I am not house arrested, that I am sitting in the house inside of my own will. You think I will stay inside my house of my own will? While my state is being burnt, while my people are being executed in the jails? Nothing more was said or done by the government thereafter, except that it is a matter of public record that Abdullah was neither able to leave his home, nor was anyone other than close relatives allowed to meet him. On September 13th, in fact, it took an order of the Jammu and Kashmir High Court to force the government to allow two national conference MPs to meet Farooq Abdullah. The court, while ordering the deputy commissioner to allow the MPs in, also placed restrictions on them. The petitioners shall ensure that their meeting with their party president and vice president is restricted to a courtesy call and to know about the well-being of the aforesaid two persons. The petitioners, after meeting their party president and vice president, in other words, that's, that's Farooq Abdullah and Omar Abdullah, shall not go to the press or media regarding their meeting and deliberations with the aforesaid persons. The government in court insisted that there was no formal restriction on Farooq Abdullah meeting the two MPs. But I want you to think about this for a second. Surely such a petition and such an order 
are only possible if Abdullah has indeed been detained. Why would someone take the trouble of going to court if they can simply knock on Abdullah Sahab's front door and walk right in? Obviously, someone was preventing them from meeting the senior leader. The government's lies were in serious danger of unraveling when the MDMK MP Vaiko moved a habeas corpus petition in the Supreme Court demanding that the government produce Abdullah and give an account of where and why he was being held and under what provisions of law. The matter was listed for hearing on September the 16th. Now, since the government knew there was no provision of law that it could cite, it panicked and converted what had been an illegal detention until then into one with a semblance of legality. And it did this hours before the court was to convene. By serving Abdullah with a detention order under the Draconian Public Safety Act. This was on September the 15th. Now, let me come to Speaker Om Birla's astonishing claim. He defended Amit Shah against the charge of lying by saying that Abdullah had not been formally detained at the time the Home Minister had told Parliament he was at liberty. As if everything in India, and especially under the Modi government, happens by the rule book, Birla then said it was mandatory for the authorities to inform the Speaker if an MP is arrested or detained and that he did not get any such information until after the September 15th PSA detention. Thus, the House cannot really treat what happened earlier as an arrest. All I can say to this logic is wah Birla ji wah. The government illegally detained Abdullah for five weeks. The Home Minister lied to Parliament about this. Two MPs had to actually approach the High Court for permission to visit someone who was supposedly not under arrest. The court grants this permission and places restrictions on what they can say after they meet this person who is supposedly not under arrest. And yet, Mr. Speaker, sir, you are saying Farooq Abdullah was a free man till September the 15th? To underline the rampant illegality of these detentions, let me briefly discuss the case of Mehbooba Mufti. I recently got to see the actual detention order served on her on August the 5th, soon after Amit Shah said the government was scrapping Article 370. If you look at this document, several things stand out. First, the detention order is not dated. Second, it cites no provision of law. Let me emphasize that again. Not a single section of the Indian Penal Code or the Code of Criminal Procedure, nor any other statute allowing preventive detention finds mention anywhere in this document. And finally, there is no expiry date mentioned in the order. It is open-ended. So just to be clear about this, a magistrate accompanied with policemen walks in with this piece of paper into Mehbooba Mufti's house, which is signed but not dated, and locks her up indefinitely without telling her under what provision of law he is acting. And this is supposed to be a democracy? I've shared this document with a couple of retired High Court and Supreme Court judges and their response, this kind of arrest is totally illegal. Of course, the question you must be asking is why don't these leaders go to court? Well, one of them did, Shah Faisal, and Vaiko went to court on Farooq Abdullah's behalf. And what happened? Faisal was pressured to withdraw his petition after he was threatened with arrest under the PSA. And the fact that Abdullah went in the night before the Supreme Court was to hear his case makes it clear Amit Shah and his officials are not people who believe in holding out idle threats. So far, I've stuck to law, or rather the lack of it. But there is a deeply troubling moral aspect to these illegal detentions. The fact is that among the hundreds of National Conference, People's Democratic Party, and Congress leaders and activists detained across the valley are those who have lost family members to terrorist attacks over the years. These are men and women who stood by the government of India's policies in Jammu and Kashmir, right or wrong, through thick and thin, not just at risk to their own physical security, but also by earning the hatred of ordinary Kashmiris in the bargain. Those Kashmiris may be forgiven their schadenfreude, but this unconscionable treatment reflects very, very badly on the Indian state. Finally, we need to consider the diplomatic damage these illegal detentions are causing the country. Apart from the bad press and the criticism uh, by politicians in uh, the UK and the US and other countries about the manner of these detentions, 
the presence of elected Kashmiri chief ministers and MPs was frequently cited by Indian diplomats at UN conferences earlier as proof that there was no longer any need to talk about a plebiscite. Astonishingly, a similar claim was made by Vice President Venkaya Naidu at a public event in Vishakhapatnam as recently as August the 28th. Let's listen to what he said. They were talking about Kashmir, this to discuss, what is there to discuss in Kashmir? Kashmir is an integral part of India. From 1952 onwards, 54 onwards, elections are held. Chief ministers are elected. There is an elected government at the state. Members of parliament are being erected. And what is there to discuss? Yes, there is something remains to be discussed. I do agree. The remaining thing to discuss is about with our neighbor is hand over the remaining part of Kashmir to us. That is the ocean. Just in case the irony of what Naidu said is lost on you, let me say this. The vice president is actually citing the fact that elections are held, chief ministers are elected, members of parliament are elected, as a reason for asserting there is nothing left to discuss with Pakistan or the international community as far as Kashmir is concerned. And he didn't realize the fact that three of those elected chief ministers and one of those elected MPs are currently in jail will dilute his argument in any way? Of course, Naidu often gets carried away with words. He wrote a whole op-ed in The Hindu last month claiming that Dr. B.R. Ambedkar had been against Article 370, citing a quote that an RSS leader had fabricated years after Ambedkar died. This when Ambedkar's collected works, published by the Maharashtra government, contained no such quote, but instead had other quotes from him advocating a plebiscite in Kashmir. I will leave the final word to the Ministry of External Affairs, which knows India's Kashmir position inside out, since it's been defending that position around the world for 70 years. In April 2003, the MEA published a document, the Jammu and Kashmir issue. Consider these extracts. The document noted that India waited several years for Pakistan to fulfill its obligations in order for a plebiscite to be held. And then it says, when that did not happen, the people of Jammu and Kashmir convened a constituent assembly in 1951, which once again reaffirmed the accession of the state to India in 1956 and finalized the constitution for the state. The Jammu and Kashmir constitution reaffirms that the state is and shall be an integral part of the Union of India. The MEA then quotes V. K. Krishnamenon from November 1957. The people, therefore, were consulted. We did not consult them privately. We did not consult them by selecting the people who are to be consulted. We consulted them by a normal process of democratic election, not even for a parliament which we established or the existing government of Kashmir established, but for a constituent assembly. And then the MEA adds in its own words, in several subsequent local, state and national elections, the people of Jammu and Kashmir have repeatedly exercised their democratic choice. There are two points to note here. First, that JNK constitution, whose reaffirmation that Kashmir is an integral part of India, the MEA quotes, well, that constitution has gone. Amit Shah and Narendra Modi scrapped it, along with the essence of Article 370. But secondly, when the government of India can lock up leaders elected by the people of Jammu and Kashmir, repeatedly exercising their democratic choice, as the MEA says, for 107 days, this only ends up becoming ammunition to those around the world who want to contest the status of Jammu and Kashmir. At the end of the day, feel free to pick the issue that moves you the most, law, morality, or diplomacy. But it should be clear that the continuing illegal detention of Farooq Abdullah, Mehbooba Mufti, Omar Abdullah, Shah Faisal, Sajjad Loan, and hundreds and hundreds of other leaders, big and small, mainstream and separatist, old and young, is a travesty that must be opposed.